How are we doing, my Where You Are Church family? It is so good to be in the house with you today. It's so good to be in your house, in your car, uh, at work, on your lunch break, or maybe you're just listening to it in the background. Wherever you are, I'm glad to be where you are when you're attending church. Um, I'm so excited to dive into week two of this new series we've been in, uh, Voices in the Wilderness. And of course, that is a quote of a quote of a quote, kind of. It comes out of the book of Isaiah where it says, uh, there, there's one, a, a voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare ye the way of the Lord, right? That's where it started in Isaiah. And then John the Baptist goes on to quote this again. And John the Baptist kind of lived this life where that was his whole life. The purpose of his whole life was to just simply tell people, hey, Jesus is coming and, and get yourself ready for it. Get yourself ready for the return of Jesus. Get yourself ready for, or not the return at that point, but the coming of Jesus. And this whole point of this series is simply to say, that's what our lives need to be. We need to simply be a voice in this wilderness of a life that we live, this wilderness of a world that we live in. We need to be the voice that's pointing back to Jesus. We need to be the voice that's telling people, get ready. So we're in week two. Week one last week, Pastor Dave brought to you. And he talked about how to be a voice in the wilderness when culture hates you, right? When you're just disliked, disloved, unloved, whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's a rough spot to be in. This week, I want to take you in a little bit of a different direction, right? Because we're used to the idea of Christians being hated on some level. I mean, for goodness sake, Jesus said, if they hate me, they'll hate you, right? He, he, he says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And it's like, great pep talk, Jesus. But he goes on to say, don't be worried because I've overcome the world and, you know, all that good stuff. But we're used to the idea of the world hating Christians on some level or another or about some topic or another. I want to flip this a little bit. Because what happens when it's not so much that the world is persecuting you or that the world hates you or dislikes you? What happens when they're not actively persecuting you. What happens when you're the one that is uh, uh, not too happy with the world around you? What happens when people just annoy you? Anybody ever been annoyed? Any, anybody been annoyed within the past week? Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Uh, what about today? Anybody been annoyed today? Anybody been annoyed in the last five or ten minutes? Probably don't want to answer that one because you're probably sitting next to the person that did it. So if you answered that one without thinking, I'm going to give you a moment now. Hit pause. Tell that person you love them and you appreciate them because, uh, yeah. But people can get annoying, right? People can get under your skin. Let's take it a little bit deeper. What happens when it's more than just annoying you? What happens when there are people in your world, people in your circle that, uh, that, that, that you really, really dislike, that their lifestyle disgusts you? right? It, it, it makes you sick. Their belief systems, the choices they make, right? Let's take a little bit deeper than that. What happens if they hurt you, right? There's this whole spectrum of people that, that may not be actively pursuing the thought of hating you, right? But they still get under your skin and you still can't stand them. How on earth are we supposed to be a voice in the wilderness to these types of people? Today, we're going to figure that out. And we're going to the book of Jonah in order to do that. Now, I know a lot of us know the story of Jonah. It's a short, it's a short book of the Bible. And, and it's, a, it's honestly a sad story. It's a pretty sad story. It ends on a low note. But there are still some things in here for us to learn. There are things in the Bible that teach us what to do. There are things in the Bible that teach us what not to do. All right? So I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you a little bit of a catch up. And then we'll spend time camping out in Jonah chapter 3. All right. So in Jonah chapter one, I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. It'll give you the idea of that chapter. Jonah chapter one, verse one says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Verse two, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Verse three, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. That tells you pretty much what happens in chapter one. God tells Jonah, this is what I want you to do. Go to this great city of Nineveh. And when I say great city, they estimated somewhere around 120,000 people were there at that time, which for one place, you know, it's, it's a pretty good size. Um, so God tells him, I want you to go there and I want you to let them know that the way they're living is not right. But Jonah says, no. Jonah decides to run in the opposite direction. And we find out later on in the story the reason why is because he was disgusted by these people. 
The way they lived their lives was just not God-honoring, was not good. It was beneath Jonah, right? He's like, these people deserve judgment. They don't deserve a good God. They deserve to just wallow in their filth and, and then just pass away and be done with it, right? Okay, so we get to, to chapter 2. At this point, by the end of chapter 1, we, we saw that he runs away and, and bad storm ends up hitting. He gets thrown into the ocean and the Lord provided a big fish. That's how a lot of us know the story of Jonah, right? We, we say he got swallowed by, a lot of us say whale, but the Word of God says a big fish. There's a whole debate on that. But there was a big fish that, that swallowed him, and he stayed there for three days. So in, in chapter 2, it goes on to say that he began to pray. Uh, I think this is a good time to pray. Somebody say amen. amen. If you have been running away from God, and now you've been swallowed by a big fish, and you're there for three days, it's about time to pray. All right? So now we're getting to chapter 3. This is where we're going to be today. And let me just tell you, there were a couple things that Jonah did right, and we'll talk about those. And then there was still one big piece that Jonah was missing, and we'll talk about that. But he gets to this city of Nineveh, and this is what we see. Chapter 3, verse 1, says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. All right? So I know there was a lot we just went over. Jonah says no to God, runs away, gets into a really bad storm, swallowed by a fish. Now he's been spit up on dry land, and the word of the Lord comes to him again, right? And the Lord tells him, Go into the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Your first point of today, how are we supposed to, to proclaim the word of the Lord? How are we supposed to be a voice in the wilderness when people downright disgust us? When people are, are, just, are just atrociously living around us? How do we do this? We do this by using God's words. That's your first point. I love the fact here that, that, that God tells him, I want you to proclaim to it the message I give you, right? He says, I want you to use my words. Look, y'all, when, when you are, especially when you are disagreeing with someone, they don't need your preferences. They don't need your opinions. They need God's words, not yours. The first point, God's words are the most important. See, when you are, when you are presenting God's word, I want you to think of it almost like you're presenting a dish, I, I, love, I love to cook, and I love to eat. All right, Anybody that knows me knows I love to eat. I love to cook. Um, here's the thing about cooking, though. If you're a novice at cooking, um, it's really important that you follow directions. Anybody, any, anybody know anybody that, that's just a novice at, at cooking? You know, they're, they're just getting started and all that. And, and look, there are some people out there who are not that great at cooking, but they still want to add a little something, something to the recipe. And their palate is not ready for that yet. You don't know what you're doing, right? There, there are some of y'all out there who will get invited to the barbecue and, and someone will say, hey, just bring some potato salad. Just bring potato salad. It's a really simple recipe. All you got to do is bring the potato salad. Look, y'all, if I invite you to my barbecue and you bring potato salad with raisins in it, we might have an issue, right? But it gets worse than that, right? Like there, there are some recipes that just seem like they're foolproof, and yet somebody tends to mess them up, right? And you just want to look at them and say, just follow directions, right? That's why it is so important that when we are presenting the Word of God to people, that we follow this book, that we follow this recipe, that we use God's words, not mine, not my preference, not my opinion. I need to speak God's word. I don't need to add a little bit in there. Here's the beautiful part. When you, when you think about a, a really good chef, right, a really good chef who's, who's in training or maybe has even, you know, achieved quite a few things, they get really close to the master chef. They get really close to the person next to them. And as they begin to grow, as they begin to learn more, then they can start adding a little bit more here, adding a little bit 
bit more there because they've learned and they've been growing. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. As you get closer to the master, as you begin to digest this book, as you begin to learn more about God, learn more about the heart of God, then that is inside of you. And now you have learned. And then, yes, you can speak to people on your past experiences. You can speak to people with a little bit of your opinion. Here's why. Because your opinion and your heart have now been grafted together with the heart of the fathers. So it's not your opinion still, right? It's this idea that, that when we are presenting the word of God, we need to stick to the word of God. See, that's why in, in, in Psalm chapter 119, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. I've hidden your word in my heart, meaning I'm taking in so much of this. That's where we need to be, family. So that when we get around the people that, that just get under our skin, when we get around the people that just annoy us or disgust us, right? The only thing that's coming out of us is the word of God, because that's what I've been hiding in my heart. That's what I've been ingesting, right? Let's keep going. So we need to present God's word. Uh, Jonah does just that. That's one of the things he does right. It's, it's almost like he, he, he's tired of fighting, right? He's, he tried to run away from God, swallowed by the, the fish and all this stuff, and now he's like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to do what you told me to, God. Finally, right? So we get to this point. Jonah does that. He presents the word of God. Uh, verse 4 says, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Sweet, simple, just says the word of God, whatever God told him to say. Verse 5, the Ninevites believed God. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Yo, that's a big deal. It's a big deal that the Ninevites believed God. Oh, how I wish so many more people around us would simply believe God at his word. Just take him at his word. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, now sackcloth is a, if you don't know, it's a very uncomfortable material. And I'll tell you why they did this in just a minute. All of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. Verse 8, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Verse 9, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Here's the thing I need you to realize. When you're presenting God's word, when you are a voice in the wilderness to people that disgust you, to people that, that you can't stand, all right? The second thing that Jonah also got right is he realized it's God's work. You got to present God's word, but it's ultimately going to be God's work. It's the voice of God. It's the word of God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that's actually going to change people's hearts. We can't take any credit for it. It's nothing that we do to change people's hearts. It's only God, and it's only the work of God, right? And I, I, I love this that it's not on you. It's not on me. We need to be obedient, yes, but it's the voice of God, again, it's the, the work of Holy Spirit that actually begins to change people's hearts. I, I want to tell you about, about what's happening here. When they put on this sackcloth, when they sit in the dust, this was a form of mourning, right? They are giving up their comforts. They're fasting, right? This king said, nobody from the greatest to the least. Even the animals had to go on a fast, y'all. He is serious about this. And the whole thing is, he is giving up his comforts. He arose from his throne, which is a big symbol, right? Because a king doesn't stand for anyone, right? He, he arose from his throne, he took off his royal clothing, and he put on sackcloth, and he sat in the dust. This was a form of, of mourning. This was a form of surrender. This was a form of making yourself lowly. Can I tell you, Jonah had nothing to do with this. This was the work of God. Now, yes, Jonah had to be obedient, but Jonah had to realize that it's God's work that's going to take place here, not my own. 
Here's what I'm trying to tell you. There, there will be some times, there will be some times where God will line it up perfectly where, where there's this person you're talking to that comes from a, from a similar background as you or a, a similar life story, whatever it might be, and, and you can connect on, on this certain level, right? But there will be other times when you have nothing in common. Let me remind you that, that the Ninevites were, were a very violent and vile people. Jonah had nothing really in common with them, but in his obedience to present God's word, God's work was able to be done. Holy Spirit was able to work on people's hearts, right? And we see that here that, that everyone begins to go on this fast. Everyone begins to, to put on this sackcloth and make themselves humble before the Lord. And we see some really cool stuff happen. Now, this is where it, it takes a little bit of a turn, all right? Because as I told you, Jonah did a couple of things, and he did them pretty well. But this last part here was the part he was missing from the beginning. Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. I'm going to move on to chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Can you believe that? Verse 2 of chapter 4. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord? First of all, that's, that's not the right tone. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? He's saying, I wasted a trip here. I, I knew it. This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, and a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 4, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So here, he, he, he's done what he's supposed to do, right? He's presented the word of God. He, he's not adding in a little extra here. He's just saying what God said to him. He realized that it's God's work that's going to take place. He just told you, I knew this was going to happen, right? It was God's work to change people's hearts and God's decision to relent and, and sending punishment. And now he is angry, right? He's angry and, and he's sitting here and he's waiting to see if God's going to pull back his punishment or if God's going to actually punish these people. He's, he's at this place, but he's angry, right? Verse 6, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Pay attention to God's response. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people, who cannot tell their right hand from their left. This exchange that just took place, even though Jonah presented God's words, even though Jonah realized it was God's work that was going to change hearts, there was one piece Jonah was missing, and that's God's heart. That's God's heart. Family, how many know that you can be doing the right things and still be wrong? Jonah did two of the right things. He presented God's word. He, he knew it was God's, God's work that was going to take place, but he was still wrong because he lacked God's heart. And this was the problem from the very beginning. Jonah looked at these people and he said, 
I'm paraphrasing, but he said, God, these people are so wicked. They're so terrible. They don't deserve a good, loving God. In fact, in his rant in the beginning of chapter four, he says, I knew it. I knew that you were a good God, a gracious God, slow to anger, right? He's listing these things that are positive as if they're negatives because he's saying these people don't deserve it, right? He's saying these people do not deserve your grace. They do not deserve the fact that you're slow to anger. They deserve judgment. They deserve pain. They deserve the worst is what he's going on to say here. And God looks at him and says, hey, look, you're way more concerned about your comfort than you are about human lives, than you are about souls, than you are about people that I created. God looks at him and says, if you were so concerned about this plant that sprang up overnight and that died overnight, why then can I not be concerned about more than 120,000 people here? Right? Jonah was lacking God's heart. There are so many times that we are so much more concerned about our comfort than the kingdom. There are so many times, and I want you to just think to yourself for a moment, how angry would I be if, if someone were to, to wreck my car, if someone were to destroy some of my possessions? How angry would I be? Now, I want you to ask yourself the same question. How angry would I be or how hurt would I be? How concerned would I be if someone, if I knew that someone left this earth without making Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior? I want you to ask yourself that question because I want you to ask yourself, are we more concerned with our own comforts than we are God's people. Let's, let's, let's go back to what I said earlier. There are those people in your lives that, that just annoy you, right? Those people that just get under your skin. They need Jesus. What about the people who, whose lives just, just disgust you, right? They live lives that are so opposite of the word of God. And in your mind, look, this is for all the, all the churchy people who've been a part of the church for so many years. They're just so opposed to God. There's, there's no way back. You know, this, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, so we say, right? What about the murderers? What about the thieves? What about the people in the LGBTQ community that you look at and you're not too sure that, that these people even deserve a good God? What about the people that hurt you? What about the people that, that, that years ago took something from you? They broke your heart. And in your mind, they don't deserve a God who is gracious and slow to anger, right? Right? The problem is we forget that in so many ways, we were them. That in so many ways, before Jesus Christ entered your life, you were just another sinner that didn't deserve him. I want to tell you why God makes this such a big deal. And as I told you, this, this book of Jonah ends on a low note. That's the end of the story. We get a grumpy old prophet who's mad that God didn't smite the city of Nineveh, right? But I want to tell you why God made this so important, why, why, why I believe he put this in the Bible for us to learn and why he was so hard on Jonah here. It's because in, in the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, and this is another quote from the Old Testament that Jesus says, but when they, in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, you can read it sometime, but they begin to quiz Jesus and they ask him, what's the most important thing we can do? What's the most important commandment? And Jesus says, you know the law, you know what it is. And Jesus picks out these two. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, with everything you have, you need to love God. And then he goes on and says, the second is like it. You need to love your neighbor. Those two, Jesus says, all of the law, all the prophets hang on these, right? This, if you had to pick out two things to live your life by, you need to love God with everything you have and you need to love people around you. Why, you might ask? It's because way back in Genesis chapter one, God said he wanted to create us in his image. That means every human around you bears the image of Christ. Yes, through sin, that image was, was vastly destroyed and messed up. But through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, 
we're all able to bear that image once more. Every single person around you matters. It doesn't matter if their lifestyle does not line up with yours. It doesn't matter if if they have hurt you. It doesn't matter if they disgust you. It is our job. It is our responsibility to be a voice in the wilderness. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. The people of Nineveh were lost. The people around you that maybe even disgust you, are lost. And if we're going to be God's children, if we're going to be a voice in the wilderness, we need to present God's word. We need to realize that it's God's work, the work of the Holy Spirit and the word of God that's going to change lives and change hearts. And through it all, we need to fight and pray to God that he would give us his heart. We need to do all this with God's heart and God's love for the people around us. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for your love and for your grace. God, while I was yet a sinner, you sent Christ to die for me. While I was lost, God, remind us all that at one point, we were all lost. Father, would you please allow us to present your word, not our opinions. Lord, would you remind us that it's the, the work of your Holy Spirit that actually changes hearts, God, that we can't take any credit for it. And Lord, as we're doing all this for your glory, let us not forget to do it with your heart. Let us not forget about the least of these. Father, would you have your way? And we will give you praise. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.